Okay, so my name is Alessandra Maurtua and I'm a UWM student and I'm involved in the field school and we're interested in interviewing you and we were wondering if you've been over the consent form um, and are aware of all the risks and benefits you get from it and also that all the information is not con confidential because it will go on our website. Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> Um, can you introduce yourself and state your name and what you do on a daily basis? My name is Pua Vang. I'm a Sustainable Communities Coordinator for Washington Park Partners. Okay, could you spell out your name, please? P-H-O-U-A-V-A-N-G. Okay, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit more about your job? <laughs> it's extremely comprehensive. Uh, I started here in this neighborhood as a organizer, and not necessarily through Washington Park Partners, but through another nonprofit agency. I was doing door to door, and I met Washington Park Partners through shared outreach mm -hmm. efforts and shared event coordination with residents. Uh, right now, I'm servicing in organizing projects, events, uh, facilitating committee meetings, organizing budgets, um, and also as a team, myself and two other co-workers, we coordinate community events and projects together. So uh, on a daily basis, it changes. Um, we could be doing outreach in the neighborhood or we might be working on promoting events that residents are planning together. We might be hauling wheelbarrows of wood chips down um, aisles in community gardens. And there's also, uh, at least seven different committees, so arts and cultures, education, health and wellness, housing, parks, safety, jobs and businesses. Those are all areas that we focus on. And again, when I say comprehensive, those categories can turn into any kind of project, conversation, or meeting. Okay. Um, I guess the next question would be, why did you get involved with this um, program? Uh, because I believed in the structure of having residents present to pitch in their ideas for projects that exist in the community. I've been in programs in the past where it's the organization or agency planning for a community uh, and giving them options of what they would like to do. This program allows residents to take the lead, learn leadership skills, uh, whether it's technical skills or organizing skills, and it helps them to de develop a sense of sustainability in terms of, as we work with these residents, we're working with them to develop them for things that they need the neighborhood in the neighborhood, including um, understanding what resources are available, and then understanding different like strategic processes that get them from point A to point see um, and then also helping them navigate like support financial support other partners to accomplish their tasks so they don't feel like they're the only ones in the in the neighborhood working by themselves towards a project so did I answer your question yeah you did I think yes. I did yeah. yeah um did you grow up in this neighborhood I did not no. Uh, where are you from? I'm from Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Okay, how was it growing up there? Um, it was similar to this. Um, I grew up in a family of nine children. Um, we had my father's mother living with us, my grandmother. Um, and then at different points of my life, we had up to 21 people in one three-bedroom household or apartment, actually. And... It mimics, this experience here mimics my experience growing up because there's a lot of refugee families and a lot of them live doubled up in households. Um, my family grew up, again, um, with that many people. We grew up on limited resources, but it wasn't a limitation of what um, we could do. So um, similar experiences to Milwaukee. Um, I could elaborate if yeah. you have a more okay. specific, I guess, yeah. like idea of what you... Um, yeah, can you compare kind of um, 
the city you grew up in, in mm-hmm. Milwaukee. Okay. So, like, the differences yeah. and the similarities you see in both. So Manitowoc has, I think they have about 36 or 39,000 people. And it's a city uh, within a county area. I think it's about two mile radius from east to west from the highway going all the way to the lakefront. So it's another lakefront city just north of Milwaukee by about an hour, uh, an hour or so. Um, and the Milwaukee is 600,000 people. So it's coming from a small town um, with less, I want to say less, not, not less opportunity, but less uh, community engagement uh, to somewhere where it's, you have a multitude of options to pick from and choose from, and it covers across all types of categories. Um, I want to say it was all just public school in Manitowoc with maybe a couple of private schools, and um, growing up <coughs> there, I wasn't Um, exposed to different activities so much. It was all just school, come back home, and then when I was 14, it was all just work, work in school, work in school. So um, coming here is, I've been able to develop my experiences in community and in other activities, so. Okay, how was it, like, moving to Milwaukee? Like, why'd you make that move from Manitowoc? Can you spell that for us? Manitowoc, M-A-N-I. T O W O C. I think I spelled it right. Thank you. Um, I made the move when I was 18. I packed up my dad's van, minivan, um, without telling him that I was coming to college. Okay. <laughs> really, I spent the summer um, debating whether or not I was going to come down, but I had already registered for Alverno and had gotten accepted. So I spent that summer saving up money. Reason why I moved to Manitoba from Manitowoc to Milwaukee was because I wanted to experience a more diverse community. Um, Being a minority in Manitowoc, I grew up um, feeling like there were margins that I had to live within, including race, um, and then just uh, financial status. I grew up being called several different things. You go go to school, you're already targeted um, by the students, and then you go home, and on your way home, there's someone calling you different names um, and telling you to go back to your own country. It's like, hey, I was born here. <laughs> so um, grew up with that experience where I always felt like um, uh, there was always going to be something that was going to limit me from moving forward. And not to say that the school system or the educators I grew up around um, were limiting. They were supportive for the most part, and they were probably the ones that encouraged me to just keep pushing at what I did. But I think that that community itself hadn't had a lot of exposure to refugee communities. And uh, so... There's a, there was a huge misunderstanding of just culture and cultural competencies and just not a lot of interest in getting to know what this group was versus uh, seeing that they may be groups of people who are accessing different types of resources that are free or um, easier to get for those who really need it. And so um, that was my experience there, but... Again, I had still had some encouraging people in my life, so. Okay, um, I know growing up as a minority is a lot different because I myself mm-hmm. am a minority too, and I grew up in a larger city of Madison, and my experience at school was similar to yours where we were like targeted. Could you elaborate a little bit more about your school experience? I wasn't in public school, <laughs> but my mom put my sister and I into a private school once. Okay. Um, it was out of fear that, uh, because in my, in my younger generation, as a young mom girl, um, or, or let's say, let's go back a few generations, like my, my parents' generation as, as teenagers, when they were still living in Laos and Thailand, um, it was common for young girls to get married really young. So I think my mom got married when she was 13. And so my mom's biggest fear of me and my sister was at when we when we turned 13 14 was that we might run away and get married too 
because within the culture it can happen. Um, not anymore, I, or not, not, I can't say it doesn't happen anymore nowadays, but the possibility of us running away to get married in the mid 90s was something that she feared greatly. So she put us into private school to, to make sure that you know, we adhere to a more rigid structure and regime and focus on our education. But that was an opportunity for a lot of students that I went to school with to just basically, again, find those margins to place me within. I had students who targeted me because of my race and students who targeted uh, my family because private school in my hometown wasn't free. My mom had to pay a little bit for um, books and I think hot lunches from time to time. And so just knowing that um, everything that my family had was either used or generic or whatever, constantly had comments from kids saying that your family is poor or um, they didn't necessarily call me any racist names, but you always knew like you were the only one being tar you were the only ones being targeted. So that was it got heavy, and I don't think I ever shared it with my mom. But I think the cost of being there for about a year pushed us out back out into the public school system, and that's where I felt comfortable growing up and being myself, challenging my own skills and my own talents. So. Okay. So do you think the public school system was better for you? I think so. I think the quality of the public school system in Manitoba was actually pretty, pretty awesome. Okay. Yeah, technology was up to date. Um, I remember having computers when I was what in fifth grade. That was, those were the days of the flying toaster screensavers. Yeah, all the way into high school, we had multimedia and technology as part of our curriculum um, or options. So. Um, advanced things that I still use today, which is helpful, so. Okay, so would you say that the public school system helped you get you where you are now, the counseling and everything? I didn't take a lot of, I don't think I developed those relationships on that level. Um, if anything, it was um, a couple of teachers who, for me, were more like mentors. Like I had a, um, a, a class where it was just introduction to law um, and that instructor who's I don't think he's teaching there anymore was one who encouraged me quite a bit um, I passed this class with an A and I passed several projects with other students who weren't present but um, he was always really encouraging and I remembered him being the only teacher to actually step forward on graduation day, remembered me by my face and my name and congratulated me. I was like, well, this, this, this guy is legitimate. And then I also had an art teacher who was beyond a teacher. He was a storyteller. So um, he would constantly teach us lessons, but also share with us um, his own lessons on life. And I think that was encouraging. My multimedia teachers were also pretty um, amazing as well encouraging and I think that them allowing me to explore options and also um, tailor my own skills was helpful in developing who I was but I mean they're only a small percentage of who shaped who I am you know at least that's for through education they shaped me but in other areas of life other people have shaped me so could you elaborate a little bit about the other people that influence had an influence in your life um when I think about where I am today, I'm in community. I'm in community because of my mother and my father. So they're both refugees from Laos. My dad was born in Longjing, which is the location for the secret war of Laos. This, the United States had the CIA um, stationed in that little village. And um, my dad was a foot soldier during the secret war of Laos, supporting the United States Army and he was about, I think he spent about six years in there. I could be wrong, I should know, but he doesn't talk about these things. So um, he was a teenager in his entire time, didn't really get too much training, but he would go and pick um, up crates of bullets that would get dropped from airplanes, and they would transport them by foot to US soldiers to support them. And um, I remember him sharing 
minimally with my mom and my mom through my mom found out that when he was um, first in there he was in there with a close friend or family member and they were side by side um, as foot soldiers and uh, the the Vietnamese had shot at them um, but the his his friend um, had gotten blown up right next to him he had jumped into a ditch with these crates on his back and broke his ribs, but he saved himself. So I think that for whatever they went through, the war-torn trek through the jungles of Laos and Thailand, just crossing the Mekong, that's, that's part of that inspiration that gets me involved because you would think that by the time that they're done moving into the refugee camps and coming here, they'd be traumatized and can't really pick up. But... My dad came here and picked up like tenfolds. Um, I mean, had ten kids. <laughs> uh, nine of them were his, and nine of them, nine of us are his. And then one of them is his uh, nephew, blood nephew. He he came from a family of fifteen children, and uh, by the time he was an adult, he had already lost the majority of his family. So that left him and three sisters growing into adulthood, and including my grandmother and my grandfather. But my grandfather passed in the camps, and in 96, he took my grandmother over, so she's another influence in my life. Um, just that, that homage that they pay to their life back there, um, they, they were extremely humble. Um, my mother was always in community um, as a volunteer translator. Any, any woman in Manitowoc who spoke Hmong and no English who needed to go to the hospital to get checked up, or uh, regardless of Hmong woman or man, um, if they needed support and they didn't have anyone to call upon, my mom might have gotten calls at two, three, four in the morning to go and translate. And she pulled me into this with her, um, probably as a security blanket. She'd be like, hey, I'm gonna go translate. Can you wake up and go with me? So I would go with her to the hospital and sit for hours with her during people's appointments. And so, that whole experience, um, if I wasn't trans with her while she was translating, then I was um, trading places with uh, uh, a, somebody's parents, babysitting their kids. So that, that was my life of service with my mom. I ended up volunteering through my church that we um, were going to, teaching Sunday school classes for non-English speaking kids. And then with my father, he gave me, my mom gave me a community service and my mom, my, my father gave me advocacy and um, community engagement. He is one loyal, patriotic man. Um, he knows the national anthem by heart. And um, his English isn't the greatest, but he understands. But he gave me great work, work ethics through just his own experiences. My sister told me about how when he first came to the States, um, I think he was only making about $3 an hour or less but he was determined to work, even knowing that he had those injuries from his teenage years, that those back ribs that got smashed in by the crates, they never healed, they, de they, they deteriorated throughout his life. So he's always had back problems, but my sister told me about how she, my oldest sister, she's about 40 right now, she told me about how he went to work one day and she was only about two or three, I think, three, three maybe. She was watching out the window and it was like icy outside on the sidewalks, and he took his bike out to, to ride to work, and she continuously saw him slip and fall on the bike, hit the ground, but he would get back up, keep riding and riding and riding. And so she was watching out the window. I was like, that's my dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it, was a, it was a good story that she shared with me. It, it's exactly who he is still today. He's retired, but at 5 in the morning, he'll get up and go find something to do. He'll get up and go to a garden and tend to it, come back home, cook, maybe take a nap, and then he'll go thrifting or something like that. But he's always taking care of the family. So um, alongside that, when I said he was a patriotic man or just a man of strong, um, he's a man of a lot of loyalty. He taught us advocacy as children when he was, um, he felt there were things in the community that were unfair. And when I say in the community, it was in the community that we all grew up in. The community grew up uh, together. The Hmong community in Manitowoc grew up together, 
when I grew up. They all lived together, communicated their issues together, and shared all of their concerns. My dad used to be that man in that that city where if there was a community meeting, everyone showed up um, at my dad's place. Um, and the living room would be filled for like hours at a time of just uh, elder Hmong men talking together about issues within families or issues within the community. And they would resolve those things together. I was too young to really understand what the agendas were, but I just remember my dad used to be that community leader. Um, and I've met people in Milwaukee since I've been here who have known him from those days. Um, those are his days where he would take us out to community protests and have us pitch signs and walk with him and the rest of residents, uh, the residents who showed up, Hmong residents who showed up to protest. We'd be, we wouldn't know what we were doing and we didn't know what we were holding, but we'd be walking around with him all day long, just sitting on corners protesting. So um, that's the man who taught me advocacy was to stand up for myself. I'd say my mom gave me that too. Um, my mom's, um, my mom's like, my mom's, as strong as my dad, she's like, um, she's like fire, but with a sense of nurture. Yeah, so, yeah. But those are my two strongest inspirations, yeah. And then the other inspirations is just coming across residents in this neighborhood and hearing their independent stories, so. Awesome, your parents sound like they're very involved and you said that your dad was a leader. Can you um, elaborate on kind of the issues that he dealt with what he protested for? Uh, I was too young to remember. I just remember the imagery from being at these places, so, yeah. Okay. Um, what is it to you being a Hmong American living in this, in Wisconsin? What does it mean to you? I don't know. I, I always go back to um, reflecting upon my parents' experiences. I think that's that's what it means to be a Hmong American. My parents and those who fought their way to get here. Um, for me, being a Hmong American just really means um, having the same opportunities as everyone else, not really seeing myself any different from any other race or any other culture or ethnicity, rather having the opportunity to like freely here in this country um, and this state, in this city, um, collaborate, give my input, and share my abilities and skills that I feel is uh, strong as a human being. Um, I know that on the surface, I project someone, you know, and uh, a specific background, but reality is I see everyone the same. So it's, it's hard to disconnect from that. I've been in community so long that I've served so many different populations of people that are non Hmong that it's hard for me to say I'm Hmong, I'm here to help you. What can I do that is Hmong mm -hmm. to help you besides translate? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, you said that you grew up with nine other kids in your household. Or I was one of I was one of nine. Yeah. One of nine. And then, and then your the first cousin. cousin. Yeah. He actually he actually was, he's, he's much, much older than all of us, so I didn't get to grow up with him, but he would come back around every so often and babysit us, so. Okay, yeah. um, can you um, just kind of tell us about the experiences you, like your experience growing up with that many children in the household and that many people, because you said mm -hmm. you had a lot of families yeah. living in your apartment as well. Um, well, to just like open it up, um, before like you imagine chaos mm -hmm. in a house with that many people, I'll just like go back to something that my dad said at my sister's wedding. Um, my, my parents live in a house that's pretty small right now. They've been in there maybe 15 plus years now, but he bought it from an elderly, el elderly man who was transitioning into a nursing home across the street. My dad was a CNA, so um, he bought the home filled us all up in there. And for so many years, like we lived in there and didn't really feel the effects of being like cramped up in one house. Because we had nine, no, actually 10 of us sharing. No, it was, it, was, it, was, it was eight children, my parents and my grandmother, sharing a three bedroom house. They, they've expanded into several different areas of space to just keep us in there. 
um, and keep us separate and give us our space as well. But um, let's see. He said to an uncle, or um, not an uncle, but a guest at my sister's wedding that, welcome to my home. Um, I understand that, you know, this house is small and it's cramped and it's underdeveloped. Um, it's, it's old as well, but I didn't build this house with my hands. If I could have, then I, I would have. But it, again, it's small. You're welcome into my home. It's not, it's not a restricting home. It's a warm home. So that's how I grew up with in, within my family is we grew up with each other. We're like we literally like on, on certain days where we were all just too tired to go to our bedrooms, we would line ourselves up on the floor on a, on a straw mat and lay pillows side by side <laughs> and sleep next to each other. Um, or we would all play with each other as children. Uh, we'd get into fights like normal kids, but I mean, we supported each other. We knew each other as basically our family. At school, we were each other's friends. Um, and there wasn't really a moment where I felt disconnected from my family. I have a sister who's one year older than me who was held back a grade. So she and I got to experience all of elementary, junior high, and high school together. Um, and um, we, we experienced the same types of um, activities. We started working together when we were old enough to work. Um, we, well, it, her more so, got into the whole dating scene. It was a normal family. Um, I have a lot of brothers who I was also close to. Um, they're into cars, um, into, they were into Fast and Furious, <laughs> just whatever was popular at the times. For me, I was, I, I've never really been a specific um, type of person. I've always been open to all my surroundings and all the people I meet, so um, I'd say I was connected with my family on intergenerational levels. Um, the siblings I was good with, my parents I was good with, my mom I only listened to her. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, have no options with my mom. Um, so, And then my grandmother, I had my own relationship with her too. Like for me, it's like just understanding what it's like to live like. Someone that's so much older taught me a lot of patience and also taught me a sense of nurturing that I didn't know I had in me besides when I would babysit and look out for kids. Um, but... There were also experiences where my parents would um, house refugee families and sponsor them into the home temporarily until they would find their own place. And living doubled up was pretty awesome, minus like the competitiveness between cousins and family members. Um, but we never had like days where it was like we didn't have enough resources. We had, it, I think from an outside perspective, we didn't have, but from an inside perspective, looking out, it's like we had enough. So, it was it was always a warm home, like my dad said. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can see that with you just speaking about it. Um, what was your first memory of that neighborhood? Um, in in my house, yeah. in growing up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's interesting because I grew up in the the. I'll just there's a couple of different places that we lived at. The house where we were doubled up um, was wasn't actually a house. It was a it was a um, complex, which by rumor I had heard that it used to be a hospital or a clinic, and then it ended up housing three families. And then downstairs was a barber shop. But it's right smack downtown in Manitowoc. It's it's no longer there, but it used to be across the parking lot from the fire station across the parking lot from, or across the street from the news reporter, and on the other side was a bank, and behind us was a restaurant. So we really lived in a very non-traditional neighborhood, and we played outside on concrete, um, ran around barefoot, um, and the home that, or the place that we lived in, we'd get kicked out every so often for a day or two to go stay at relatives because we didn't know about lead paint being issues. And then cockroaches, yeah, they existed all throughout that place. As children, we would go right up to them and just smack them. But now, like, being an adult and seeing those conditions, it's like, whoa, that's really unacceptable. So, I mean, we, we, didn't, we weren't limited by anything that we lived around. We, were, we tried to 
make do. That site was um, um, raised at one point, but for, for me, my memory of that place is that it was home to myself, my family, um, my aunt, and her children who lived upstairs from, from us, um, grandparents that are now uh, no longer here, um, and other cousins. So throughout, I wanna say about five to eight years, at least six to seven different families transitioned in and out of that three apartment complex until it was finally raised. And now it's just, it just uh, is the grounds for um, the fire department entirely, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, when you started working with this organization and mm -hmm. working with Washington Park, what's your first memory of that neighborhood as well? Uh, my first memory of this neighborhood was before working with Washington Park, actually, because I've been here since 2004, housing refugees. But I don't know if it's my first memory or my preferred memory is walking onto 41st and Lloyd and bringing a resident that I had never met a resource, um, but that block was packed with people and they were just hanging out on the porch. So I brought the resource, it was a housing resource to a woman who had called and asked about it and I dropped it off at her door, but I decided to stop next door where um, there was family, friends um, just hanging out ended up talking to them and just getting a couple of minutes of history of what existed on that block. But I had also parked my car um, next to uh, this, the site where a, a young teenager was uh, gunned down in, I think it was 2011. And so I asked that neighborhood about it and I remember them telling me that that was one of their boys. Um, uh, and each year they, they'll like memorialize him on the tree, but the best memories or the first memories or the preferred memory of this neighborhood has been working on that black throughout the summer um, and really just getting to know these folks and being able to go back down the, the streets years and years later and um, some of them still know who I am if they still are there or seeing some of them getting involved in different things, um, different aspects of programming through WPP. but. That, that neighborhood, it, the imagery of that neighborhood is like the memory that's the strongest. And it, I'll, I'll always call it like my, my first true experience, I guess. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, you said that you stopped after you dropped off the package to the house next door mm -hmm. because they were family friends and they gave you a little bit of history. What, yeah. kind of the, what were the kind of things that they told you about the history of the neighborhood? Well, being that first timer that just walks into the neighborhood, it's not like they're gonna have a super strong conversation with you, but they just shared with me that um, if anything, their, their issues was there's a ton of kids and we all need to be out here looking out after the kids, whether or not they're ours, ours or not. Um, I understood through the summer that a lot of these families moved in and out and when the kids got together to play, they played together in random areas. But even with the park being across the street, they felt like it was a little bit too dangerous with traffic not being considerate. And so um, there was one family in particular, um, multiple last names, but I'll just um, go to the, the main woman who I spoke to. Her name was Vicki Fox. She had a set of twins um, and an older son daughter and several younger children living in the home from her sister as well. Um, they lived next to the vacant lot and they were the first ones to come out with me um, to do a neighborhood cleanup. It felt like we had like 40 people there and it was like 10 o'clock in the morning on a summer where kids should be sleeping in but they came out and helped clean up the neighborhood and it got me meeting other neighbors along the way too but um, they talked about the violence that had occurred in the block throughout the years. Um, they talked about uh, the, the issues of just keeping the kids safe, but then wanting to have the kid, wanting to have activities for kids to do. So really we worked that summer to resolve those issues, but on a 
smaller scale, like no budget really. Um, but the partnership of WPP, they came through and they supported um, in making sure that if we had events with these kids, um, they were there as well. But we ended up transforming a vacant lot into a mini football field and kids celebrated. 75 kids, that was the impact that I felt, I guess, was that from out of nowhere in a neighborhood, 75 kids showed up just to celebrate. So, I mean, issues, again, comes back to um, mainly making sure the kids have something to do and that it's productive and safe. So we ended up possibly being babysitters for the kids in, in several different sessions of projects that we did, cleanups, um, events on the vacant lot, uh, there would be times where I would be trying to leave and they'd still be running around my car. So it'd be like, it's getting dark. You have to go home. I don't know where you came from, but you have to go home before it gets pitch black. So, but they would stick around. So until eight, eight thirty, almost even nine sometimes. Yeah. Do you think that um, this community involvement helps the kids kind of have something to do, keep them occupied throughout the day, focused maybe on school as well as having an outside activity? I don't know if it I don't know if it does that directly, but I think it has some positive influence on their way of thinking and knowing that you know there's time set aside to play, you know. So community events um like we had football games with kids and we brought diverse kids together, diverse groups of kids together to play. Um like they they I think it helps them understand there's a time to play and a time to study. So, and I only got the summer with them. I didn't really get the school year with them. Maybe only once did I get to do a, an event with them, uh, and that was about October. But that was when the parents did start coming along with their kids. Um, but in the summertime, it was just kids coming through. So I didn't really incorporate education, given, you know, really I just wanted them to have that activity. Um, but, but, I think it's something that they remember is influ influential about their neighborhood, and it might have them thinking more so about community responsibility, rather. Um, I shared this with my former director here, but before I started, I went to the bus stop coffee shop before they shut down, and some random kid, and I apologize, I don't remember his name, because again, like, so many kids filtered through, but he stopped me outside of the shop. He said, hey, football lady. I said, what? He said, football lady. I said, okay, uh, what's up? And he's like, so when are you gonna come back and do the football field for us? I mean, right now that lot is occupied by Habitat for Humanity Home, but we had borrowed that lot from them. So in my mind, I was thinking, gosh, it's been like a year and a half, two almost, maybe since like I probably did anything with it physically. Um, but he remembered so but he remembered that something big happened on his block um, and it transformed the experience that he had in the neighborhood for a long time so to have him come back and like call me out and tell me that he remembered that was impactful um, and in my mind I'm thinking you know it at least opened his mind up to seeing that he has opportunities to do the same things um, from here on out but yeah, school. We didn't focus on school. <laughs> yeah. Um, it seemed like what you did was really impactful for the community. Do you have any other dreams for this community, for the Washington Park community? I don't. I just wait for them to share, and then that's how we drive our projects. Here is we offer the sense of openness to hear out what their ideas are, and and then I think that's where our our input comes along is. Not so much to tell them exactly how to do it, but get them used to doing it in a way where others will feel comfortable engaging. So we give them a specific process. We help them initially just break down their ideas, and then we help them plan, and then we help them budget for things, and then we help them implement. And then if we have time, we evaluate it all, but reality is, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of the projects here in this neighborhood are resident driven, um, resident led, or at least that's what we hope. I hope that I'm not here forever and it's not in offense to this neighborhood or anything. I, I just hope that I can teach people how to develop things for themselves and they lead it, you know. If a program like this 
to redevelop community shouldn't exist forever. Uh, at some point, it's supposed to be sustainable, so, yeah. Exactly. What were some of the projects or ideas they kind of brought up to you guys? Mm. I want to say there's been ongoing activities with gardening initially with ever already too, but throughout the past 15, 20 years or so, there's been a number of gardens that have popped up. If you think about Milwaukee on a citywide level, there's always conversations about gardens existing in different neighborhoods, but never really this one. <clears throat> and so um, last year, a group of residents decided that they wanted to do a garden tour. And so we got them together um, with no preference over whose garden we were focusing on. Rather, we did an evaluation of the neighborhood and found like 15 to 20 gardens that actually exist in the area. Some were just pocket parks, po pocket park gardens, but some were actually growing vegetables. Um, and did a tour of, I wanna say we, we had on the list to visit at least five to six. We, we got all of those completed, but we showed residents where other neighbors were gardening. Um, I was able to evaluate that. There were probably over 100 committed gardeners living in this neighborhood. This neighborhood has 10,000 people, and we only work with about 700, and we don't work with 100 gardeners. I think we would work more with like half of that, you know, 50 maybe. And I'm being realistic, but, um, but it, it's just nice to know that they're able to tell me some small things that they do next door to their home or down the block from them, and then I'm able to find someone else who does something similar and then connect them to each other. And then we just build up that um, line of communication amongst neighbors, and then they share their ideas and everyone is mutual on the idea that, you know, we should all promote what we all do on a greater scale. So that's kind of what we do here with residents, um, is we just help them build up their projects. But we've never owned these projects from the beginning. We've really just helped them develop that path to get to um, where they need to be in terms of getting resource or in just simply wanting to celebrate something they worked hard for, so. Um, where are the major gardens you guys work? Uh, there's one on 31st and Brown. Exact address is 3118 West Brown Street. And then there's one on 29th and Walnut. That's outside of the Washington Park neighborhood, but we've been working with that one since 2013, but it used to be a garden prior. It's just that no one was managing it. 32nd and Cherry, which I picked up this year, amazing work done by residents. Um, that one's fenced in, and it's just directly southwest of the Esther factory lofts. Um, I know there's one at 35th, and Lisbon, just a little bit south of ONG. Um, it's a beautiful one across the street from this neighborhood here, from, from our agency here. If you just cut through the alleys, there's a triangle garden. Um, I've picked bitter melon from that, those vines before too, so yeah. Okay, why do you think that the gardens are most demanding mm -hmm. or the most thing that um, the community is asking for? I want to say not the entire community, but there's a lot of refugee communities who are dependent upon eating um, produce that's not that that's not sold in um, grocery stores that are around here, and so they'd rather grow. Um, plus, growing is that experience that gets them outside of their homes. Growing is that experience that might expose them to other neighbors that they're comfortable with. So. Um, Really, it's just for the source of food. A lot of families that I've met are living on fixed incomes or low income. And so if, if they have that skill and ability to grow, they're going to, yep. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think it's just one way that they can show off what they're good at, yep. Exactly. Um, you said that there's a lot of refugees mm -hmm. in um, communities. Yeah. Um, about how many are there, are they frequent? I don't know how many there are living in this neighborhood, but I know that there are about, possibly at least in the neighborhood, there are about 200 um, homes that are owned by 
refugees who were placed here maybe about 40 years ago, placed in the United States 40 years ago, and they've transitioned their home ownership to being prop, or their owner occupancy to being property managers. So a lot of them have moved out, or some of them have moved out, and some have transitioned to just renting to other refugee communities. And the reason why they've done that is because when you come here as a refugee family from a different country, regardless of if you're uh, Somali, Burmese, Chin, um, or Karen, Karen and Chin, Hmong, uh, Vietnamese, Laotian, doesn't, or Thai, or, or Serbian, it, it doesn't matter which background you're, uh, you're from, I know a lot of former or longtime refugees will rent their homes to others because they don't qualify to um, fit the standards of what a, a normal renter would qualify under, which is uh, having residency somewhere else for a certain amount of time, having income for a certain amount of time. So there's the empathy from these landlords to rent to these families. And then the cycle kind of just gives back to itself, so, yeah. Um, for these homeowners, uh, are most of them set up by the city? I'm not really familiar with the process. Could you kind of explain? I don't think so. They, these are independent homeowners who okay. bought properties here because property was mm -hmm. affordable. Um, I think the cheapest you can get a place here is like maybe 2500 I've seen at least in property sales. So you'd end up having the responsibility of fixing up these homes um, turning them over so that they're uh, up to living standards and then they end up renting them out but from my knowledge um, perhaps they've bought properties from the city and I want to say that a lot of them have utilized um, housing resources from the city including uh, loans and grants forgivable loans but I don't know everyone's history with their um, home so, um, would they just be homeowners that offer their houses to refugees then? I think they, I think so. Yeah, yeah a lot of them are. Yeah. Okay. So, um, let's see. I mean, the refugees do pay rent too, <laughs> but. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you see in the future for your organization and the community together? Where we're at a turning point, we're at year five of our sustainable community plan, which is in 2010, over 100 stakeholders, residents, partners, and businesses and agencies came together to develop objectives to accomplish and goals. And throughout the years, all the way up until this year, um, they've ac accomplished quite a bit. We've learned from um, what's um, feasible and what can really, really require more development in terms of financing or more experts at the table to help us really um, like change the things that they wanted to change. But I think that after this year, a nice long break to just really evaluate what worked and what didn't work and where the most community engagement existed would be nice. And then that, that would help us continue a discussion about how we move forward. So um, it depends on who's all at the table. I mean, I, I, I envision this program to have more community residents who are ready to take the leadership um, and to also share the accountability of the plan and whether or not it's successful um, to, to share in on the fact that there are disappointments along the way that not every project and goal and plan that everyone has in mind works out, but that there's always going to be opportunities to um, develop resolutions together and plans to just like cope together. Um, I think that it's not really about everything that they want to accomplish, rather it's about that they have really, really strong relationships to depend on and I think that's what builds up this community and helps them move forward. So I can't envision five years out from now. Again, I keep my mind open to whatever's coming in and then I help build from there, so yeah. Okay, that's awesome. I really admire everything you guys are doing for the community 
Thank and you. All the work that you put out there and all your time and all your your parents and everything they did and what they taught you. Um, Thank you. Really, yeah, I don't really have any more questions. Do you have anything to add? Maybe not. Okay, <laughs> I mean, I could talk to you about it, but okay. I mean, not not in public presentation. Yeah. 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 So. Okay, we'll cut yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You'll cut it out. Yeah. But I you. Guess we okay. Can pause it too. So in the conference room, I noticed all of the awards and all mm -hmm. the tapestry hanging around. Do you yeah. have any connections to these awards or the tapestry? These were all before my time. Um. I don't even know who did the tapestry. So, but there's the Mandy Award, which was 2014 um, Milwaukee Area Neighborhood Development Innovation. It's a, I think it's kind of like Milwaukee's um, award ceremony of the year. I know that the program had received it. There is a, there is a LISC and Milwaukee Police plaque somewhere in here that was won for safety initiatives. The only one in my time was the Groundwork Milwaukee Award, which uh, we received for that garden tour. Um, it was a 2015 award where they recognized that the garden tour brought gardens together. And I don't want to say it's the influence of, but it may be inspiration for the fact that there's a garden group that's meeting now citywide. So you don't have to put that in there because I can't take credit for anything that um, I, I'm not even a part of, really. So, But on a citywide level, there's a group that meets now, and they share inspiration from one garden to the next. So, yeah. Um, this is part of the original plan, though. So one of the first photos from the neighborhood. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. It's, so, it's a great... Is that a... Photograph or painting? Um, somebody said that too. I think it was a photograph turned into a painting, actually. And this might be what one of the prints, because if you come up really close, mm -hmm. then you see the details. But I don't even know who the artist is. David M. Lenz, maybe? Yeah. Pretty cool. I always thought it was a photograph until somebody said it. So you could check out the words if you want. I still don't know. One of the townhomes thing, I think that one is in conjunction to UMCS, the agency that founded, um, not founded, but WPP itself was a program pr uh, prior to coming into um, the agency. But um, it was done by a couple different local area community-based agencies, and then UMCS picked it up. But prior to picking it up, UMCS received uh, awards and support to develop townhomes for women who were transitioning out of homelessness into permanent housing. And so they built all these townhomes on the block down here. You can probably take a walk down there if you want, um, or you've probably been down there already. Um, and they house families. Um, I think it's about two units per building. So everyone has a garage to park in. Um, they can garden in a little pocket garden in the alley. And then they have access to supportive services here as well, on site. So they expanded their mission to serve women and children to serving the community through the WPP program. So now it's like this expansive um, operation. But on our levels of working with communities, like we, have, we have no boundaries really, so yeah. Do you have any other stories you would like to share with us about yourself or about working here? Mm, 
I met my grandmother and my grandfather's neighbor. Did I ever tell you? No? Okay, so in 2013, or was it 14? 13. Um, fall of 2013, I took a walk in the neighborhood with um, former WPP staff, and we're doing outreach. Really, I think we were just connecting with folks to see what, how, how they were doing. And um, we're on about 33rd, almost to Lisbon, and I stepped up to one of one of the one of the persons I was doing outreach with couldn't reach the woman that was outside, and so um, they asked me if I could go and talk to her. And I went up to her, and she seemed really uncomfortable. And I said, "Hey," I called her Grandma. I said, "Hey, Grandma in Hmong, how are you doing?" And she's like, "I'm fine. What are you doing?" And then I said, "I'm I'm a community worker. We walk around. We knock on your door sometimes, and we come and check up on folks just to see if." they're doing okay, if they have any issues that we can you know, help them out with or if we can connect them with resources. And so she still was really uncomfortable, but um, after a couple of minutes I explained to her, these are my coworkers really from the community. We all come out and do the same things together. Um, and I just wanted to find out about you, who you are, um, how long you've lived here. And she told me, I've been here for about eight years and I live here with my husband. I said, do you live upstairs, downstairs? Because it was a duplex. She says, I live um, upstairs with him. So her, her ability to speak was like still pretty awesome. Her memory was good. Um, we talked and talked, found out that she and her husband used to live right next door to my grandma and grandpa inside the refugee camp. And I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> it hit home for me. I was just like, this is why I do this job, you know? Like, working community is not to find personal connections, but the moment that you do, you're just like, wow, you know, it's amazing. From around, from around the, from halfway around the world, you know, I meet people who lived in the same place as my grandparents. I never met my grandfather, my dad's father, but I met my dad's mom, my grandmother. She was the one that I took care of, so. And it was just, um, let's see, two, two years after we lost my grandma. So for me, it hit home, it hurt really bad, but really good. And, a really strong way and I think that I caught her at a great moment because when I came back to WPP to do outreach um, I, I went up to her house again one day and I went and said hi to her she didn't remember who I was and I said do you remember I'm the gal that came to your door a couple of years ago and you told me you lived next door to my grand and grandmother and grandfather and she said no I don't remember I don't remember so at her it within the past two years she's lost her sense of memory and just recently I found out that her husband had passed, which is unfortunate, but like to capture at a perfect moment and a perfect time, just a story that, um, that, that, that just connects to you personally is pretty strong, yeah. So that's the best thing I've experienced, <laughs> I guess. Um, so, yeah. Wow. Do you have any similar stories? Have you ever met anybody else that was in contact with your family or had to do anything with your family? I've met a lot of people who knew my parents, yeah, but um, nothing quite as amazing as this one, yeah. I think that it, it didn't have to be a personal connection to me. It was just their story that usually just gets to me, and I'm just like, wow, I <laughs> want to get to know you more, so, but, but that one was, it was pretty awesome. And I asked my parents about them, and they didn't know who I was talking about because they were already here, and they didn't live in the camp with my grandparents. So, yeah. How far away is Manitowoc from here? <laughs> Manitowoc is, I think, Manitowoc. about 70 miles away. 70 miles? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when your parents came to protest, um, did they drive over here? Or? Uh, we protested in Oshkosh um, over something. And I, we, we drove there, my dad, um, before seat belts were required, <laughs> my dad would shove us all in his car and we would sit one on top of each other's laps or there would be one hiding at the foot. <laughs> so, yeah, he would drive us out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's just the whole community a lot, kids, um, a lot of adults, okay. but I think my dad wanted us to get involved and to see what he was involved in. Again, he's just this man of um, 
a lot of loyalty to towards different issues and even if he didn't explain what he was doing like we knew that we had to go because it was important or else so mm -hmm. yeah around what time period was it where you think did the protest i think it was the i had to have been about six or seven or eight so late 80s early 90s okay. yeah so that was a kind of a time for change um was there mostly men involved in the protests or would women also be involved in for the protests i remember there was a lot of youth okay. and adults men and women alike okay. yeah okay. yeah <laughs> Um, from my parents' perspective, they have um, different things that they advocate for. I think the last, I, I haven't been involved any in my own time here because I don't know where my time is <laughs> um, until it's like dark outside. But my, the last one that my parents were involved in was actually to support um, the former uh, or the late General Bang Pao. They were here in Milwaukee actually protesting downtown. And I was actually working at Catholic Charities at the time, I think. But they were thirsty or hungry, and they had called me and said, hey, we're in town. We've been walking around um, uh, downtown at a government site um, for a few hours, and do you mind dropping off some water? They didn't tell me they were there for a protest. I go, and um, this whole building is wrapped with, with Hmong, Hmong people from Wisconsin in white T-shirts trying to... Um, support him so that he would be freed because he had ended up um, being involved in a um, plan to try to overthrow the country of Laos. But I, I know he was released, but he, he's, he's now deceased. And, and so they, they were strong supporters of him because they saw him as their leader. My father was one of his um, soldiers under his leadership. so. I think that he, they went to protest that, you know, at this stage, this man isn't even strong enough to really advocate for himself anymore. If he has a plan to overthrow the country of Laos, um, it's not gonna work, but we advocate for him because he's our only leader that that stood up for us and brought us over here and gave us opportunities. So, so that was the last time, that was, um, I think, 2009 or 10 or 11, maybe. Couldn't remember, yeah. That's very yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. Do your parents still live in? I'm gonna have trouble with his name. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, Manitowoc. Manitowoc. Yep. They do. <laughs> I can't say yep. it. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a Native American name. Okay. That means two twin rivers or two two rivers, I think. And okay. then there's a smaller town called Two Rivers just north of it. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah. So you said they did. Um, mm -hmm. Do they any did. of your siblings still live back there? I have. <clears throat> A younger brother and a younger sister that live with my parents. Yeah. Okay. But Are you the oldest in the family? Or no, you're not because you have older siblings. I'm in the middle. Middle? Yeah. Okay. I'm exactly in the middle. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's why I was able to come here. I was the only kid in my family actually just like kind of disappeared to go off to college. So, yeah. Okay. When I graduated, my dad was like all sniffling holding everything so in, <laughs> couldn't cry, but just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. have any of your younger siblings followed in your footsteps? Uh, I hope they don't, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I'm not that bad, but um, I wanna say they, they, they do their own things. Um, I think I, made, I was the only kid in the family who went to college for four years, but that was, I think, because of my own fears of possibly ending up married young, too. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then also just because I was into certain things, like I wanted to write stronger than I used to. So, and then I wanted to be, be involved in a job that might open me up to a, a bigger community too. And that's what, exactly what happened. I don't know where I wanted to be, and I still don't, but I'm happy. So, exactly. yeah. As long as you love what yeah. you do right now. Yeah, I think my siblings are happy the oldest ones ended up going back to school. One is an officer, and then one is a nurse. And then I think my dad had a lot of influence on half of my family because half of them are in healthcare. So, okay. yeah.
Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> mm-hmm. center myself and mm-hmm. how important it is when you you go into a community and something as simple as a field is really important mm-hmm. because I used to play in fields with my friends, kickballs, yeah. clubhouses, football, stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I just want to thank you for all of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, all the work you do is truly great and valuable. Trying. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a huge partnership. Can't do it by myself, so <laughs> Especially chipping that aisle. <laughs> that was hard work. 90 plus degrees. Yeah. Wow. But it's all done. Really? Yeah, I went back out there and helped Angela do it um, the following Friday, mm-hmm. it was. Yeah. And her granddaughter came out too. That yeah. is so cute. Okay, so because I went out there before and no one was there and mm-hmm. it was half mowed, like all of the um, weeds and stuff. So oh, half mowed? Just yeah, today? Right. Um, it was about a week ago. Yeah. If if it wasn't half mowed, it was that a a. Like the front part was just mowed a little bit, and then. Oh, the grass was mowed. Yeah. Well, the city mows the lawn there. Oh. Um, until they understand somebody has a permit, mm-hmm. and so we just have to get a permit through Mug. But for the actual garden part, um, I was able to get a um fund of about maybe 300 to see if I could find someone to come and physically till that land because I can't imagine anyone standing there and hacking at weeds all day so they need an actual like little trailer or a tractor tractor tiller to dig right into that ground and get all those high weeds out so and that's been our struggle otherwise there would be vegetation on there already because I went to 32nd and Cherry and there's like little heads of red cabbage or, or not red cabbage um uh, red leaf lettuce and all this other stuff growing so but they did their own in each plot because a tractor I don't think a tractor can fit in there so yeah that's too weird mm-hmm. um, you talked about like all of the, the vegetable gardens and stuff do you normally go out to different gardens and ask if it's okay to pick some of the vegetables to eat in my agreement for any of the residents who are um, growing mm-hmm is to extend the generosity to give a little bit away to someone who might ask. Um, I've told them in advance, I might come and pick up their, pick their vegetables and some look at me and don't say anything or some say, oh yeah, of course, of course, come whenever. So I tend to not, I tend to buy produce from the um, gardeners who are growing larger quantities. And I usually do that when I, I'll stop by their place and drop off forms. Um, I went to a woman's house on one of the farmer's market vendors, went to her house last summer, and her truck was loaded with lemongrass. So I helped her unload it, and then she gave me a bunch of vegetables for the garden tour that we had. So I tend to buy from her or, or another gardener that I know will have excess amounts. Yeah. That sounds really tasty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's all we have for the question part. Okay. Will you be ready to do the the tour of the garden? Um, do you have to do it right away? Uh, we have until about one forty-five. Oh, today? Yes. Oh, that is just a verbal interview because I have to get supplies ready for an event that oh, I have to lead. Yeah, something okay. So, okay. yeah. And then plus we can just go on the go over it on our own time. And mm-hmm. You gave me a. a yeah. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah. Yeah. Just that with else. Yeah. Sorry. Oh no problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. fine. Otherwise, if you catch Angela, see if she wants to come meet up with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You still have her phone number? Yeah. Yes. Well, that's all for the question part. Mm-hmm. Thank you for your time. Yeah. No problem. Really Thank you. Understand. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this community's yeah. like successes. Yeah. I, I don't think I have shared even a quarter. So, mm-hmm. yeah. it's really interesting learning about everybody in this community mm-hmm. and like the work that you guys are doing. Together. Yep. Thanks. No problem. Well, I look forward to all of this in the end. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You saw a regent hold me hostage to answer a question. So, I wrote a bone the other day. No. 
I did uh, for the balloon activity. Oh, yeah. yeah. So. I didn't see you. I waved to you and everything. We, we came and cooked for like two hours, and it was just super hot. And then I had family who said they were coming already to visit. So then we told my chore we can only cook. So we ended up cooking for her kids who were with me, then, and then we left. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, we grilled hot dogs. That was it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, they still taste nice because I love food. Yeah. She said about 250 people showed up for that event, like filtered in and out, which is kind of cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She has like a tiny little budget, so. And then it was just her as the only staff member. So we said we would go and help her out for a little bit. Yeah, I know the kids were selling lemonade, right? Mm-hmm. To raise money for yeah. Free refills. Yeah. They're so adorable. Yeah. yeah. They're actually, a lot of them are junior high, high school kids. Um, Most of the volunteers? Mm-hmm. All, all of the volunteers who were working the games, they had been planning since January. Oh, wow. So, yeah. That's good. Yeah. They're pretty awesome. Some of them I've seen grow up, which <laughs> when I see them all grow up, yeah. hey, I know you. You know, because I met a lot of them when they were still like seven or eight. And then some of them are like on the website of their place at like five years old and she's like whoa they're now like teenagers exactly. so that's yeah. how I feel about my little cousin he graduated mm-hmm. high school and, uh-huh. and it's like you were this big exactly <laughs> yeah that's yeah. how I feel about um because I'm to new life when I was younger that was the resource center oh yeah um, and I still notice all of the smaller children mm-hmm. well they were younger than I was yeah and we have pictures of them or mm-hmm. us together and I'm just like oh yeah they're in high school, graduating from high school, and right. on my way to college, and I'm just feeling like, oh. Super awesome. Super <laughs> awesome, yep. It's the best feeling in the world when a kid succeeds. So, oh, yeah. yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Children are so cute. Thank you for your time again. Yes, thank you. I didn't get to shake your hand. So, yeah, nice meeting you. Thank you, Ever. Well, you know what? I'll give you a hug, too. Yeah, thank you. No problem. And also for the, because I was talking to one of the program director about mm-hmm. her husband's cat, and he doesn't have it anymore. Her uh, husband's cat program director. Yeah, the um, to till the yard. Because um, remember, I told you that. Um, oh, okay. I remember you telling me. I don't know it's if okay. I emailed you that. But I think you did. Well, I apologize. It's okay. Okay. It's okay. Um, if you know of anyone else, I have about three hundred dollars. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. And it's about, if anyone asks about size, it's 0.34 acres, but you take that center aisle out and it's just a little bit less. Okay. Maybe 0.3 acres. Okay. Yeah. A little over a quarter. Okay. That yeah. makes sense. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, ladies. I'll let you help yourself out then. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. If you don't mind, just hit the lights. Of course.